internet. Welcome back here. Yeah. And I have to welcome somebody very special. It's Air Vice Marshal Hugh Slatter, Division Air Force. And I can tell you, if you don't know who this guy is, you're going to find out who he is. Now, I've been following his life for a long, long time. It's a great pleasure for me to speak to you, sir. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. May I ask you, where do you come from? Now that you end up in the Rhodesian Air Force, <laughs> then we'll go over and see what happened to you further. Yeah, good Good evening, Chris. Good morning, my time. Good evening, your time. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And it's always good, the stuff that you do. Congratulations on what you guys do. Um, I was born in Rhodesia. Uh, it's the land of my birth, which is one of the reasons it was uh, so painful for me to leave. But um, I grew up, went to good schools there, Highland School, Churchill School. Started going to college in Durban, or university, as, as uh, we call it there, but although it was Howard College. Did not do well at, at university. <laughs> After a year, jumped on a motorbike and rode home and said to my folks, I'm home, I'm not doing this. And they said, well, what do you plan to do? And I said, I don't know, I'll think of something. So I got temporary work at the archives in uh, Salisbury, and that was pretty interesting. You have access to every folder and every bit of history there's been. But after about six months, I saw an ad in the newspaper for the Rhodesian Air Force, and I'd always liked airplanes. And I had some family history of aviation. Uh, we were talking earlier about Leonard's letter. And so I applied, um, just kind of on the fly, if you'll excuse the pun, because it was like, well, I'll give this a try. And luckily got through all the selection processes. I mean, that was pretty stringent and it was interesting. I think there were, uh, I don't want to be quoted officially. I think there was something like 600 applicants. And we ended up with a couple of dozen for final interviews after you'd done all the <laughs> aptitude testing. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, narrowed us down to 12 who started the flying training. We went to Thornhill. That training is similar to the SAF and most other Air Forces. We did 18 months of uh, initial training and then basic flying school and then advanced flying school. And then once you graduated, you went on to an operational conversion unit where you learned to operate the airplane as a weapon. And that was the, the most fun part of the, of the training as far as I'm concerned. And then you start your rotation through the squadrons. And I did several squadrons. Uh, four squadron with doing instruction and that was sort of the internal security squadron two squadron which was the jets the vampires and ground attack um seven squadron was a fun posting in those days and i did four years on seven squadron seven squadron became very famous later on it's the helicopter squadron seven and eight squadron but later on that became kind of a, a torrid posting because the the war was really heating up there were a lot of good ground defenses against uh helicopters especially, and um, it was nothing like that in my day. We had the odd small arms fire against us, but um, you were much luckier or much more likely to survive four years on 7 Squadron in 19, late 60s, early 70s than you were in the late 70s. And then, of course, the other squadrons, which I didn't go to, 5 Squadron Canberra's, 3 Squadron Transport, um, 8 Squadron became the, the Bell, or the Augusta Bells, the Hueys, uh, and, I, and I didn't fly on that. But what was nice was as time went on and I got some promotions, I ended up with some good postings. I ended up doing a tour in South Africa on what was called a top secret operation, training our pilots down there on the Impala. That was fun. And uh, we made such good friends down there. We had good support from the SAF. We had good support from our technical team there too. It was a, it was a good time. And then... Um, back to uh, do some flying at Petersburg um, for converting pilots, and then back to Thornhill. I served some time out on the Eastern District in Operation Thrasher, which was our Eastern uh, operational area, along with a very wonderful general by the name of Derry McIntyre. I don't know if you know that name. And uh, he was first class, took me under his wing, helped me along. But I wasn't there for very long, and then I was posted to the best job I ever had in the Air Force, which is OC flying at Thornhill. And I was fortunate because if you're OC flying, no one can tell you what airplanes you're going to fly and what you're not going to fly. And I had a very understanding commanding officer. You'll probably know the name, Tol Janica, 
Group Captain Tol Janneke, extraordinarily good commanding officer. So that was the team down there. And what was lovely about that, this was 78, 79. So the war was busy and our squadrons were full time. But if there were any aircraft left over, Tol and I would grab normally a vampire. I like the little single seater. And we'd go off and join the operations, which was always good. You know, you had to make sure that the squadron commander was happy with you doing that because it's not always squadron commanders who want the station commander and the OC flying alongside them, but they were always good. So those were, were good times. And um, sadly, we lost some pilots too, as you probably know. But at the end of the day, that was, uh, as I say, the best posting I ever had. <clears throat> and from there, I went to um, uh, Officer Commanding New Serum. So still involved with the war, but in a different way. That was three squadron and five squadron. Five squadron, of course, was hugely active doing well-known bombing raids with my buddy Green Leader, Chris Dixon. He was on pilot course with me. Chris is no longer around, sadly. A good friend of ours, good friend of mine. And then from there, I went to Director of Operations at Air Headquarters. So although you're sitting at a desk a lot of the time, or not sitting actually, you're in an ops room, obviously, you're still involved with airplanes, but not, not much flying. I was able to get away occasionally. And then promoted to Director General of Operations. And I think it was about that time that, of course, uh, Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, and became Zimbabwe, 1980, April 1980. And I then became chief of staff shortly thereafter, I seem to remember. So that was, I was still able to do a little bit of flying, but it wasn't wartime flying. The war was basically over. And uh, sadly, that war was costly. Lost a lot of my friends and a lot of good pilots and a lot of good soldiers. And it was true of both sides, obviously, of course. You know, war is not a, not a good way to go. They say violence is the last resort of the incompetent except that we were trying to defend our homeland, so it made it very different. And we managed for 15 years, but finally, as you know, the um, the resources of Zebra and Zandla, sponsored by Russia and China, just were overcoming us. We were running out of manpower. We were running out of ammunition. We were having difficulty with fuel, even though South Africa helped us a lot with fuel. So the war became really unsustainable for us. And although we hung on and tried to get the best terms, I'm afraid the Brits reneged on a lot of their deals. You probably know all that story. And we ended up with a, a very different government. Uh, interestingly, after independence, uh, when I was, I think when I was still DG Ops, I was asked to brief Prime Minister as he was then Mugabe. And there's a lot written about Mugabe. And of course, he became this very um, paranoid individual who did a lot of harm to the country. But he did not start like that. And I say that because I was, I was able to brief him on several occasions. And I found him to be uh, very courteous, <clears throat> very interested, asked good questions, responded, always thanked me for the briefing, and just gave a whole different impression to what we'd been led to believe by the by the media. However, as you know, that didn't last. And um, I think with uh, he became paranoid about uh, whites and about Zipra, and the whole thing just sort of fell apart. And it's somewhere around there that uh, the sabotage incident occurred in 82, July 82, I think, and uh, <clears throat> which led to my arrest and imprisonment and all the bad treatment that I and others suffered. And then, uh, you know, we can go into any amount of detail you want on that. But after that, um, when we were declared innocent, uh, after a nine week trial and a five week adjournment while the judge considered his opinion. And I was concerned because I thought maybe this is a political setup. Maybe we're going to be taken out into the courtyard and hung because that was the penalty for, for treason, which is what we were charged with. But anyway, the judge, who was a fine man, he was the, uh, the, the chief justice of the, of the Zimbabwe High Court, Justice Enoch Dumbachena. And he delivered his verdict, and it was a pretty stinging rebuke to the Central Intelligence Organization and to the police for their behavior. 
And of course, that didn't go down well with some of the more extreme ministers. I'll mention Dr. Herbert Ushawakunzi, who was, I think, Minister of Home Affairs. So he promptly re-detained all of us in prison. And it was only after a world furor led again by our senator, even Britain got involved, Margaret Thatcher got involved, as she should have done. And um, after several days, a couple of weeks of trying to strike deals with us, um, the Zimbabwe government wanted me and Phil Powell to fly out just to disappear. And we said, no, we're not going. We're not going unless all of us go. I mean, I've, you know, what, what more could they do? We'd been in jail for a long time, you know, but I didn't particularly care for, for prison, but, uh, you know, we, we were alive. So finally, they gave us an ultimatum that um, unless you leave, uh, we're going to detain you indefinitely, which they could. They had the political power to do that. So we all sat down and chatted about it, the six of us, and we decided that we could probably do more outside the country than inside the country. And that was three of us, Phil Powell, Pete Briscoe, and myself. Well, the day before we were due to leave, they said, no, we're not letting Pete Briscoe go. But you, Slatter, and you, Powell, can go because we know you didn't do it. I mean, what an admission now, having had us locked up for 13 months, tortured us, jailed us, threatened our families. I mean, it was just staggering. But on the morning in question, I think it was September the 8th, one of our prison guards came through and said to me, <coughs> sir, they always called me sir, it was interesting. And they were, they were a pretty decent bunch, actually. He said, you're leaving tonight. And I said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, it's just been on the BBC News. So I said, oh, okay. Well, we went about our normal day, which was we were allowed out of our cells for most of the day and in an enclosed courtyard. At about four o'clock, they always locked us up again. So four o'clock, we locked up, and I thought, well, this is it. And then my cell door was opened, and so was Phil's, and we went down to the head warders officer, first-class gentleman. Um, the prison service had not been badly infiltrated at that stage by people who were not well trained and who who were not really racist at all. So we sat in his office. Uh, his name was Mike Mays. I'm sure he doesn't mind me mentioning his name now. He was fair and honest and a good man. And uh, he said, yep, they're going to fetch you and take you to the airport tonight. You're going to, to, I think he mentioned London, but I wasn't sure. Anyway, that flight was due to leave at nine and at eight o'clock we were still sitting in his office and I thought, boy, this isn't going to happen. <laughs> and then a bunch of people arrived and they wanted to put us in handcuffs. And I said, why, why do you want to do that? And they said, well, we don't want you escaping and it's for your safety and so on. So they bundled us into the car and off we went. And we got to the airport and they said, okay, out to get. I said, I'm not getting out. This is all in my book, actually. And, and I bring this up because it still, it still irks me the way they behaved. And they said, no, you've got to get out and go now. The airplane's ready. And I said, I'm not going anywhere. You can just take me back to prison. I'm, I'm not getting out and going through in the public. I'm a free man, and I'm not going through their shackles like you guys are. So that created a bit of alarm. And they made some phone calls, and they said, OK, uh, we'll take your handcuffs off, but you must promise not to escape. And I said, I'm <laughs> escaped what? <laughs> anyway, so we went through the airport. We were ushered onto the plane. The plane was ready to go. I mean, everybody was waiting, and we were the last in there. You know what it's like walking onto the plane when the whole plane load knows that they've been waiting for you? Yeah, I thought, oh, I'm so sorry. So we got on there. And in fact, funny enough, there was some applause going on. So obviously some people knew what was going on. And there were reporters sitting in the plane and so on. And they flew us to London. We got to London, there was a big, they wanted a big press conference, and we'd been warned that if we said anything at all, uh, a couple of our, our mates back there would not be released. So I just said, you know, thank you for your interest, thank you for your support over the trial and so on, but, you know, I, I cannot answer questions, nor can Phil. I hope you'll understand the situation. So that was a bit of a flat press conference. But anyway, um, it took about three months, but eventually the others came out. Pete Briscoe came out about three weeks later, and then the others were released in dribs and drabs as they didn't want to make a fuss about it and wanted to save some face. So that's when we all started our new lives. Pete and I came to America. Phil went to Malawi. Barry Lloyd, I think, went to Australia. John Cox went to South Africa. Neville Weir went to South Africa and then back, back to the UK. 
to the RAF where he won, I think, won the sort of honor for the second time. Um, who else was there? Nigel Lewis Walker, who wasn't in prison with us. For whatever strange reason, they'd hidden him away in a, in a detention center and we, we never even saw him. And he was only released much later. And his father, Jack Lewis Walker, who'd been in prison, Jack was an MP. I don't know why they arrested Jack, but you never had to know anything. That was the, that's what, a, what happens in a dictatorship, unfortunately. So I came to America, which is where I am now. And, uh, you know, there, there's a whole lot more detail that we can go into. If you want to pick an area of detail, I will tell you about America. I'll tell you about Tom Eagleton. I'll tell you about uh, the incident of being arrested. Where, where would you like to go, Chris? I think so. We should start by explaining to the people yeah, what actually happened, because they wouldn't know why you were arrested. I think okay. there were some explosions. The new aircraft arrived from the UK. And yeah, you were sabotaged by someone. Yeah, no, good. Of course, I'll start there. We had done. Um, I was. Uh, I led a, an evaluation team to look for new airplanes, and we went to England and France and Italy and Spain. And in England, we flew the Hawk. In France, we flew the Alpha Jet. In Spain, we flew the 101, and in Italy, we flew the Aramachi 339. All good airplanes. Anyway, long story made short, at the end of the day, our evaluation team decided the Hawk met all the criteria, the essential criteria that we had. One of those essential criteria, which is where the other airplanes couldn't match it, was to have 450 knots through the target with dirty weapons, by dirty weapons, external stores. And the reason for 450 knots was that we were running up against Strela, uh, surface to air missiles in those days and 450 knots through the target gave you a safety margin. It wasn't guaranteed, but it was a lot better than 300 through the, through the target. Anyway, so we acquired the Hawks and the first four Hawks came out in about June or July, 82, I think. The evaluation exercise was in 1980 and it took two years to get all the stuff finalized. And at the time, I actually happened to be on vacation. I was in Malawi with my father-in-law and my wife. And then I went up to Nyanga when we came back to do some trout fishing with, um, funny enough, a, 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 a member of the American consulate, really a good guy by the name of Peter Shields. And when I came back to the cabin one night, there was a message waiting for me saying, call DOPS immediately. So I called DOPS, one Gordon Wright, you may know that name too. Rhodesian rugby player, good, good guy. And um, he said, there's been a very serious incident and um, I can't talk over the phone. And I said, okay, well, I'm coming back. So I went back and saw the commander, Air Marshal Walsh, and he was extremely upset. Uh, we had had, um, if I remember rightly, eight, eight hunters damaged or destroyed. The four new hawks that were sitting in the hangar damaged or destroyed, and a lynx, which was our um, lighter ground attack airplane, destroyed. So it was, I mean, it was it wasn't half our air force, but it was a lot of our air force. It was a lot of our strike capability. Anyway, a board of inquiry was formed. I went down on a visit to Thornhill to look at the damage. It was horrendous. I mean, anybody who likes airplanes to see these twisted, mangled, burnt wrecks, it's a, it's a sad, sad event. There were some incredibly brave people the nights of the explosions. Some saboteurs had crept in, placed charges in the intakes of the hunters and the hawks, and left. They'd got in because it seems our security at the base was not up to standard, and they left without trace leaving this trail of destruction and carnage. But a lot of the people that night when the explosion started going off just left their, their houses and their homes and their billets and came running and pulled burning aircraft out of the hangars, explosions going off everywhere. How, how more people weren't killed, I don't know. But they did a great job recovering what they could. And when I went down there, I tried to be positive. I said, you know, we've been through tough times before. We'll go through tough times again. In the meantime, let's just get all this fixed. Well, it wasn't long after that that um, the CIO started investigating the Board of Inquiry. They didn't like the Board of Inquiry. They thought it was some cover-up. Now, the CIO 
had some very experienced, well-trained, mostly white officers and a lot of new black officers. And what the government was trying to do, led by some of the extreme elements, was to make sure that there were no whites representing the Board of Inquiry or even cooperating with the Board of Inquiry. So long story made short, the CIO started arresting people. They started with Barry Lloyd, who was our security officer. And as it turned out, later on, tortured him badly until he wrote some statements that they liked. And then they moved up the line from Barry. They went to Neville Weir. They moved up to Johnny Cox. They moved up to Pete Briscoe. They moved up to Phil Pyle. And the pattern was the same in each case. They, these people would be arrested. They would be disappeared. Nobody knew where they were for weeks on end. And what was happening is they were being moved around the countryside, hidden. Lawyers couldn't get to them and being tortured until they wrote the same incriminating statements. And then it ended up with me. I was also uh, arrested, taken away, frisked around the country, always hooded at nighttime, never really knowing where you were, not much in the way of food or water, um, and then finally tortured until you signed the same statements that the other guys had, had written and signed. And for the longest time, I resisted this stuff because I thought, this is nonsense. I mean, this must be some game or it's a trick to see if, to see if I'll change my, my, um, my reports. But finally, when they did all this stuff to me, and then they talked about my family, I thought, no, this is not a game. This is um, These guys are determined that they're going to trap us. And so I wrote some incriminating statements, hoping that at some stage there'd be a chance to go to court. But you never knew, because I thought, what happens if I get shot now? And they say I was shot trying to escape. So you would, you would never know. But anyway, that didn't happen. Um, they tried some further tricks. They tried putting us in front of magistrates to confirm the, the statements. But they stood right outside the window and said, you better confirm your statement or else. I wouldn't confirm my statement. When the magistrate asked me, he asked me three times and I, I wouldn't answer. So he just said, well, I'm, I'm confirming your statement. And all this came out in the trial later on. So that was that. We were put in jail in, in Guelo for eight or 10 months. Then we were moved to Chikarubi, which is the big max security prison in Salisbury. They were, they were paranoid that we were going to be rescued by South Africa. And I kept saying to them, what the hell are you guys talking about? This has nothing to do with South Africa. I still believe that it had nothing to do with South Africa. But anyway, finally, we were put on trial. Uh, they had intimidated our own lawyers. They had arrested our own lawyers <laughs> because... They said, if you're representing Slater, you must be crooks as well. You know, so you, you're going to jail. Anyway, they didn't go to jail. They actually paid a fine and didn't go to jail. We tried to get Sidney Kentridge. I don't know if that name rings a bell here, yeah, the, the, the civil, uh, civil rights lawyer in South Africa, but he was busy. And he recommended one Harry Ognall, who was a Queen's counsel from Britain. And it turned out to be the finest man I've known in a long time. He was actually the guy who um, prosecuted the Yorkshire Ripper, that infamous case of that guy. So he was the only guy successfully to prosecute the Yorkshire, the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, so Harry came out, and this is a funny story, because <clears throat> I was sitting in my cell, and they said, come, there's someone who wants to see you. And, and they'd never tell you who it was. So I'd go there, and he said, hi, I'm, I'm Harry Ognall. I'm here to represent you. And I said, oh, that's terrific. That's a you know, we chatted for about half an hour. He said, just tell me what happened to you from the time you were picked up until now. So I did quickly. I've been, you know, I went through all the African names that I could remember and the places and the times, and it was, it was pretty quick. So he said, okay, good, thank you. He said, I'll, I'm going to see the others, and then we'll see you in court. And I'm like, whoa, 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 you know, you don't have enough information. You know, there's much more. He said, no, I've got it. It's fine. So, and the same happened with the others. It was a, a remarkable brain course. And when we got to the trial, and he cross-examined all the police and the CIO and so on. This was a guy from England. He never got a place name wrong. He never got an individual name wrong, like Mwiri or Matonga or any of these strange African names to him. He never got a time wrong. So every time the police lied about something, he'd say, stop, didn't you just tell me this? And the guy said, yes. He said, and now you're telling me this? Yes. So which is true? Are they both true? So, I mean, you know, the judge was just writing notes. You know, this is not like trial by jury. I don't know if you know how the system in, in Rhodesia works. You know, you have a, a judge and two assessors, and the assessors determine the matters of fact, and the judge determines the process of law. 
So that went on for a long time. And Harry said to us, don't worry that I'm not going to jump on them all the time. I don't want to be this big shot lawyer coming out from London and making everybody look silly. So he said, let, just let me get on with this. So I was on the stand for three days, no fun. And then one by one, they went through us. So that took nine weeks. And a lot of these people that the CIO had intimidated got up and said things that weren't true. And Harry pulled them apart every time. And then the judge recessed for five weeks. We were back in prison in Chikarubi. So we played bridge and talked and wondered what the hell was going to happen. Were we going to be hung or weren't we? You know. <laughs> and then we went back to the judgment day. Oh, the other thing that I should tell you, when we went the first day in court, I said to my guys, we're going in uniform. We're serving officers. We've not been fired or, or demobbed or whatever it is. We're all going in uniform. So when we came upstairs from the basement into the courtroom, the prosecutor had a fit. I mean, he, was, he started ranting and shouting, get, out, get them out of here, get them out of their uniforms. And so, so the judge said, stop, very calmly, he said, come to my rooms. So they had a talk, Ognall and the prosecutors, Makushi and, and uh, Justice, uh, Justice Dumbachana. And then they came back out and the judge said, we are going to ask you all to put on civilian suits, if you will. So the prosecutor had wanted us to come in prison garb in handcuffs. And the judge said, no, you know, you're considered innocent until proven guilty. So bless him. That was the start of this guy. And then at his judgment, finally, um, he went through the stuff and he really chewed the police out and the CIO out. And I thought, wow. And then, of course, he ended after about a three hour uh, discourse saying, all these men are innocent and they're free to go. And of course, the courtroom, which was packed, just exploded, you know, and everybody was delighted. So we said, we, we're going downstairs to pick up our, uh, the rest of our clothes. We'll come outside because we, we were going to have a little celebration. And as we're going downstairs, the guy comes and hands us, us detention papers signed by Ushiba Kunzi, charged with treason, the same things that we were charged with 15 months ago. So they took us back to Chikarubi, and of course there were some ugly incidents outside when people realized what had happened, and there were some racist remarks and so on, which didn't do anybody any good. Um, but anyway, we went back to Chikarubi, <laughs> and our warders there, who were, who were always this good bunch, said, what are you doing back here? You know, ah, why are you here? <laughs> uh, you know, just solid guys. And we said, well, we'll, we'll see. And, and anyway, then, then I'm sort of backing into the thing where 10 days later, well, two weeks later, Phil and I left and went to London, and then later the other guys came. So we were arrested on false charges of treason stemming from the sabotage at Thornhill. And the sad thing is it did an immense amount of harm to the Air Force. A lot of people who were debating, should they stay, should they go, they were just like, I'm gone. I'm not going to have that happen to me. And it had happened to a lot of others. I mean, they actually weren't charged with anything, but a lot of others were badly treated and removed from their families and just had a torrid time. So the whole policy, the whole decision behind that sabotage, still in my mind, was the most stupid, irrational decision I've ever thought of as a military man. And, you know, I, I have no quibble uh, with the soldiers on the ground. I do have a quibble with whoever authorized that decision. I think it was a poor decision, and it reflects badly on, on intelligence and common sense. Having said that, I'll shut up. <laughs> I need to ask you a question. Air Vice Marshal, what, what is the equivalent rank in SAF for that? Would it be a, a major it's, general? It's, it's, a, it's a major general or a two-star general, as, as yeah. you see here. Yeah. And the commander of the Air Force was a three-star or, a, or a, a lieutenant general. And coincidentally, I was due to assume command of the Air Force on the very day that the trial started. So I, I, I wasn't aware of that until afterwards, but apparently, and this is not official, but this is, uh, came to me through various sources, the president who was in Mugabe had approved my appointment as commander of the Air Force. And that's one of the reasons why I say that I think, you know, in the initial days, he was relatively solid and that things just went downhill rapidly when he became paranoid. You're absolutely correct of that, sir, because I read a book by Ian Smith, who was the Prime Minister during yep. UDI. Right. Also, I believe it's a fire pilot. Now, he said that he met actually uh, Mugabe 
And he went back home and he said to his wife, he thinks Rhodesia will be in good hands. He, he did have, he, he started off as a very solid man. And then afterwards, sadly, for the um, Matabele uh, massacres and genocide, things just went wrong. He just went the wrong way. Yeah, and that's exactly was my impression too, because um, you know we'd had all we'd read all this dreadful press on Mugabe before the elections, and and look, you know, I think things were wrong in the elections. I think that um, there was a lot of intimidation that went on, and I'm not sure that it was justifiably a fair and honest election. Not at all sure, but as it happens, it it was uh, it was ratified, and so we tried to get on with things. And uh, a lot of my friends left. <clears throat> and and uh, I respect their decision. But having been born in the country and my family having lived there and um, having served the country, I thought uh, I could do better by staying. You know, and um, it turns out that was naive. <laughs> well, I just want to clarify this for the viewer because we're talking four or five decades, decades ago. Imagine if some aircraft explodes somewhere and the two-star general and other senior officers or grad by your CIA or FBI, it's not possible. But imagine that. And then you will understand what actually happened here. And then these senior officers are not only grabbed, they tortured into fake confessions. They get to court. Now I found innocent. Now I'm alone. I'm qualified as one two decades ago already. So I can tell you that once you're found innocent in court, there's no way you can go back for the same crime. And then so these people walk down the stairs. They didn't even get into the sunshine. I think so you were still in the shadows of a building when they grabbed you again. It is yep. totally unfair. It's ridiculous. It's beyond, it's beyond anything which, which, which you can explain legally. And yet this happened. And that's why, why there's such an outcry. But now I must ask you, sir, we can go back to the sabotage. You've seen the wrecks of these aircraft. And it saddens me to call them that, because I like aircraft. Would you say it was a professional job, sir? Would you say that these saboteurs were trained professionally? This wasn't just some okie from the street. This was a guy who actually knew what they were doing. Yeah, <clears throat> I would I would agree with that, course. I think, you know, the fact that the explosives were placed down the intakes of the airplanes uh, in an area where they do the most damage obviously required someone with knowledge. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trained in sabotage. I've never, I've never studied explosives or anything like that. But um, to call it professional, I, I guess he or they were professional soldiers. Were they professional saboteurs? Maybe. I don't know. But, the, but they did a huge amount of damage. So in that regard, they probably felt they were successful. And I don't know if they ever realized the ramifications of what was going to happen, that they weren't just destroying aircraft, they were destroying the Air Force, and they were destroying the fabric of society in our country. So if there's someone who took uh, delight or joy or satisfaction in that, then again, I have to come back to say, I think it was the worst military decision I've ever thought of. Yes, especially so. I, I remember... And I stand to be corrected, but no one else died. They just got in and they um, planted the explosions and then they ran. So they got yeah. in without being seen and they got out without being seen. But I never understood this. And I said this to you before, and I said it to Wing Commander, uh, Prop Kalanais as well. I just don't understand why this operation ever took place because the Rhodesian or Zimbabwean Air Force at that stage were no threat to South Africa. They would Makes not sense. have and bombs out of Africa or anything. They would not have been able to do so, even if they wanted to. They would have probably been intercepted by the Mirage squadrons uh, based up north. So it makes no military sense on what happened. No, nope. you're not going to start an argument with me, Chris. I agree 100%. It was, it was. It made no sense as a decision, none. In fact, it, it was 180 degrees wrong because it, uh, it caused so much damage. Now, if there were people who thought that was the plan, then I'm sorry to disillusion you, but you actually destabilized half of Southern Africa. No, you're quite correct. I mean, nothing good came from this. I mean, no. you people were replaced by a Pakistani Air Force general, if I remember correct, and we have nothing yep. wrong. But it's just, it could have been that there was a friendly face that side, because obviously, Saf 
South African Air Force and the Rhodesian Air Force knew each other very well. You, you could call each other, you could talk to each other. Now you could. Yep. Now that, that, that angle now disappeared. Yep. Yeah, the, the guy they replaced, <coughs> they put in charge, was his name was uh, Dowd Porter, and I never met him. But I sent him a message from prison and I said, it would be nice if you visited your guys in prison. There's there six innocent of your six innocent officers sitting in prison here. Never got a message back. So the whole thing was political, of course. And um, I don't know whether the CIO were directed to go down this path or whether they were just incompetent and they couldn't really find out what had happened. But uh, it, it was it was. Um, a tragedy, quite honestly. Yeah, it was a huge tragedy. So up to that time, we had great respect for the British South African police, for the Zimbabwe police. They were yep. really good policemen. They, you know, oh, they were right. they excellent. Were in the way they looked, they dressed, they were well trained. And suddenly this happened. And CIO was known as a good intelligence service. They, they were really not known for this type of thing. No, when does, I'd, I'd like to touch on something there, of course. When you mention, <coughs> excuse me, the British, the British South Africa police. <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, they were an extraordinarily good police force. I mean, I can remember them from the early days when they were courteous and polite and efficient, and they were like that until the end, quite honestly. And while we're talking about the the police, I want to mention a couple of the other services who. We, we all know how good the army was, the RLI, the SAS, the Salu Scouts, the uh, Rhodesian African Rifles. I mean, we had very fine troops, <clears throat> a lot of whom paid the price during the war. And may they, may they all rest in peace, I mean, and their families. And we had people, you know, Guard Force and Internal Affairs and so on, who were the kind of the unsung heroes as well. So I do want to pay tribute to all those guys because I, I was Air Force, but we did a lot of work with the other services, like like you did in, in uh, with the SAF. And um, that war uh, cost thousands of people dearly. And that's why war is not always a, a good avenue. But as I said earlier, if it's a question of defending your country, you're going to do it. So... I agree with you about the BSAP. <coughs> Sorry, let me drink some tea. That's my granddaughter on my mug. <laughs> I don't know if you can see. Yes, I can. If you can twist it slightly. Yeah, we can see. We can see. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, she is feisty. Very feisty. Takes after her grandmother. <laughs> oh, Where's yeah. my wife? She can't, she can't hear me, can she? <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about your wife and family. So it must have been odd for you now to be in London. And you know, they're on the threat that side and probably being watched. And uh, how did you get them out? Yeah, that's a good point, uh, Chris. <clears throat> when, I, when I was able to smuggle a letter, and my wife didn't know where I was because that's what they did. They moved us around the countryside and she was beside herself with her and she got local lawyers. And of course they gave the local lawyers the runaround so they couldn't find us either for two weeks until we'd written these so-called confessions. But I smuggled her a note and I said, look, they've been very clever. They've set me up and the others up and I'm done for. So I suggest, and it was a painful note to write, I suggest you leave, leave the country, go and start a new life with the kids and I'm gone. You know, I'm finished. I got a message back from <laughs> through the lawyers saying, um, the kids are already out of the country and they're quite safe, but I'm not going anywhere. So there. And she stuck there and she coordinated a lot of this stuff with the lawyers and helping fundraising. Lawyers are not inexpensive, as you know. But uh, they did a great job. And uh, uh, some of the legal firms were very good. They waived a lot of their costs. And I appreciate that. And I'll put it on record as I appreciate that. So they were very good. But she was strong through the whole thing. I mean, eventually when the wives were allowed to visit us and then they would, they would, um, they would come and visit us weekly in the prisons eventually, bring us some food. And uh, Jane had a very, very bad auto accident about 
eight months into this process, nine months, in, I was at Chikarubi. And one of the chaplains, really good guy, he was the chaplain general, Val Raja, uh, came and said, um, "Your Jane's had a bad accident. She's in hospital, but she'll survive and so on. So that was some added stress, but she pulled through that and she she nearly lost her leg. In fact, the surgeon wanted to remove her leg. And Norman Walsh, bless him, said, nope, I'm not authorizing that. <laughs> and obviously the surgeon was, so Norman, we have Norman to thank for saving Jane's leg. But she was very badly injured and couldn't walk. And actually on the day of the judgment, she showed up in the courtroom in calipers and crutches just to be there for the trial. And then, then when I was flown out to London, she could only join me like three or four months later on. But she was strong throughout the whole thing, course, and um, has been a pillar, pillar of strength to me for my entire life. We've been married 54 years now, and uh, she's, she's really a, a fine woman and uh, full of integrity and strong and feisty, as I mentioned <laughs> But anyway, uh, and, and and all the wives did a great job. I mean, it wasn't fun for any of them. They didn't know what was happening to us. It was probably harder on them thinking, well, you know, one of these days we'll probably hear that they've been hung in the prison, you know. So, yeah, I take my hat off to all the wives. They they did a wonderful job. And we're blessed to have them. That is very true, sir. That is very true. Yeah. I want, yeah. I've heard the story, by the way, when you people left Zimbabwe to start a new life somewhere. I mean, you've been now in the Air Force all your life. You built up a pension, you're a senior officer, and then they stole your pension. I've heard they would not pay you out. I mean, the, the Zimbabwe dollar at that stage was worth something. It's worth nothing today. Yeah. So yeah. you had to basically restart your life, so without any nothing. Yeah, you know, they reneged on the deal. The deal when we agreed to leave was that we would leave on the grounds that we would uh, go through a normal retirement, retain our pensions, and uh, be allowed some time. They reneged on everything of that. We, <clears throat> we, we were taken from our prison cells to the airplane. And that really irked me, of course, because one of the things I wanted to do as chief of staff, I mean, I knew a lot of the Air Force, the squadrons, the guard, everybody, and I wanted to go around and thank them all you know, for their service. Never had that chance, and that, uh, I thought, was was unnecessary. Funny enough, with the other guys later on, they, they gave them two weeks or three weeks to sort out their family affairs and so on. So it just shows you the irrational approach to this whole thing. Um, yeah, I left with them. Um, we had... Uh, what was it, $300 in traveler's checks, 300 Zimbabwe dollars in traveler's checks and a suitcase. That was it. And uh, luckily I had some friends in England that I stayed with and they were wonderful, Bobby and Roy Neat. We stayed with them. I thought it was going to be a few nights. It ended up being five months. <laughs> and we're still friends. <laughs> um, and then when we went to the US, I mean, I had no money in the UK. They still hadn't paid any pensions. So I got on the dole for like two months. I didn't want to, but Bobby said, you're entitled to it, go and get it. So we did. That was, I think, 90 pounds every fortnight, but it helped keep the wolf from the door. But when we went to the US to immigrate from, from Zimbabwe, basically to the US, we had to borrow a thousand dollars from our friends. We had no other money. So we landed in the US my wife and our, my two kids and me with a thousand dollars that was borrowed and each had a suitcase. Luckily I had a job to go to, otherwise they wouldn't have let me in. It's not like today where you can walk across the Mexican American border, be given food and everything. Now, you know, I had to have a, a job and a means of support. So we survived on a thousand US dollars until I got my first paycheck at the end of the month. <laughs> And it's not bad, Chris, because you remember some of the things that you took for granted, you know, that every, everybody thinks it's okay. So it's not bad to be reminded sometimes. We lived in a little, uh, in an apartment. We had a, 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 a round table with four chairs. We had a TV, of course. You can't live in America without a TV. <laughs> 
the kids each had a bed and Jane and I slept on the floor for um, oh, six months or something like that. Carpeted, but anyway. And so, you know, those that takes you back to your humble beginnings, and I don't regret any of it. It makes you really appreciate life. So, and then my company that I joined was very good to me, and I was able to progress through the ranks there. And as time went on to earn some money and be able to buy a house and a home and, and on and on and on. So America has been very good to us. And Jane and I are very grateful. I know Pete Briscoe was very grateful. Pete had that dreadful bloody brain tumor just out of nowhere. He lasted three months, the saddest thing I've known. So we're still in touch with his family. <clears throat> They're like a second family to us, Paddy Briscoe and his kids who are not kids anymore. They've grown up. But that was sad. Uh, Pete and I were shared the same cell for a long time. He was tortured badly before I was, and just um, just a solid guy. Did Did you know the name Pete Briscoe? He came out of South Africa and joined our Air Force, actually. Yes, I know the name. Yeah. And I'm wondering yeah. if he thinks he suffered a didn't cause that brain uh, tumor. It yeah. It was very sad. He was coming back from Korea, I think, because he was working for McDonnell Douglas on the T-45 program, which is the, the Hawk program, basically. And apparently they night stopped in the hotel in Honolulu, and Pete couldn't get up the next morning. He got up and fell down and got up and fell down. They got him home, and they diagnosed this damn brain tumor, and they couldn't couldn't fix it. It was, it was dreadfully sad, really tragic. I miss that guy. He was a good man. Anyway. Life moves on. I know eventually you write a book. I believe its name is uh, Pilot Prisoner Patriot. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> I would uh, recommend anybody to go and read it. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Chris. It's still available yeah, yeah. and we'll put the links here as well. But can you just tell us quickly, sir, a few minutes, what, what's it book about? Yeah, you know, for um, for the longest time, I thought I wanted to put on record something for my family and the grandchildren and so on, so that they could remember. Um, so, th so this is it. And finally, I decided just to sit down and write it. But it was initially meant to be a family book. And then a lot of people showed interest. And I started thinking, well, maybe it's worth publishing it. And if we publish it in itself, we can provide some funds to veterans. So Hannes Vessels, bless him, uh, took on the challenge, did a super nice job with the book, and it sold, I'm not sure how many copies it sold now, because we just sold it initially, uh, I sold the American and international sales, and Hannes sold the South African sales, so it was two separate businesses, basically. But when we did it initially, I didn't want to put it on Amazon, because Amazon takes a share of the profits, and I wanted all the profits to go to the veterans. So after I admit, actually, I exceeded my, my goal for the veterans with donations. And then Hannes decided that he would put it on Amazon. And I said, well, that's your business now. I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. So it's on Amazon, and people can buy it on Amazon. Um, and bear in mind that the profits do go to veterans. You might be interested in, in the back page. Do you, do you recognize who's with me there? Nick Price? Yes, it looks like a golfer, sir. Yeah, it's Nick Price, oh, wow. world number one golfer in 93, 94. So there's some good stories about Nick in there. He and I spent a lot of time together. Um, he used to work for me a little bit in the Air Force. And there's some funny stories that I've included in the book there. He's a good man. He's done a, a lot for, for golf and for the world. <laughs> so that's that book. This is the other one I showed you, Sabotage and Torture. And there's Pete Briscoe. I don't know if you can see on that back picture there. Yes, we can see. With the moustache. <laughs> that was written by Barbara Cole. She wrote the SAS2. That's not in, in, in production anymore. But you could probably find, if it interests you, you could probably find something on eBay or Amazon or something like that. So yes, thank you for those books. And, and the money's... Uh, as I say, have helped veterans organizations here locally in the US, in South Africa, and in Rhodesia and Zimbabwe. So it, it was, it, I'm, I'm pleased it worked out like that, because it was good. I have to say, in 1980, when the Rhodesians start coming south, there's a lot of good books which came out. And probably the best one of them all is Bob Rocco. She was just oh, fantastic. On, on, on the SAS. No, she writes very well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, she's good. 
I don't know if she's still putting books together. I haven't followed it for a little while. Hannes has written some good books, you know, A Few Hard Men and others. You know, he's he's very prolific with that stuff. Yes, he's got a wonderful channel as well. One which, funny enough, hopefully gets people to play as well, as well as yep. this is a bit strange. I have to yeah. say from a personal viewpoint, uh, Barodesians, I think South Africa owe a great debt towards Rhodesia. And I also think that we owe a great apology for what happened when our nationalist leaders decided to betray Rhodesia. But they basically withdrew all support for whatever reasons, and they forced a settlement which didn't work, uh, the Lancaster House Agreement. It is said that in one of those uh, meetings which I had at Vic Falls, on the bridge, that they were so drunk they couldn't even stand upright. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that's what some of the policemen who were there told me. And I for myself too, when I was in the police, I was trained by the Rhodesians, the ex-Rhodesians who came down south. And they were fantastic people, I can tell you. Yeah, look, when you talk about being so drunk you can't stand up, I've I've been there, of course. <laughs> you know, we, we used to uh, party a lot and so on. But anyway, um, to your point about being betrayed, I don't feel we were betrayed, of course. I think, that, I think that South Africa had no alternative. South Africa supported us bravely and substantially and for a long time. And I take my hat off and I say thank you to the South Africans who did that. I can still remember fuel tankers being driven up through Guelo and so on when we were short of fuel. But eventually what happens is that even South Africa, with its great infrastructure, lacking the one essential, which is endless supplies of fuel, you know, when countries like America decide to hold your feet to the fire, you can resist just so long, which is what we found out too. So I, I would rather remember with gratitude South Africa's support. Uh, it was hard for them to do. They were a voice in the wilderness supporting us, and we appreciated that. So it did not surprise me. It was disappointing, but it didn't surprise me when when that perspective had to change. And that was basically the um, the final straw for us. We couldn't survive without that without that help. Certainly not the fuel. But anyway, it's history, Chris. I don't think Africa is any better for it, um, but it's done. And I would rather remember with gratitude the help that we were given. So thank you. Those are great words, sir. May I ask you a last question? If there's any youngster looking here towards you, listening here, wants to be a combat pilot, would you tell him to go for it? Or would you tell Do him to speak? Do it. Just like Nike, just do it. Yeah, you'll have a blast. You'll meet more friends, that lifelong friends, than you ever imagined, and the friendships will last for life. I mean, I still talk to my Air Force buddies from, uh, what, 60 years ago now. Toll's a good example. We still see each other too, so. I still see some of my South African friends. Yeah, yeah. It's good stuff. Gus, it's been very interesting talking to you. And um, thank you for all you do. It's important that these messages get around, I think, and people are made aware. And I know you do a great job with that. So thank you. Appreciate it. We thank you, sir. And to everybody listening here, let me tell you, let me tell you, you were not unimportant. Don't, let me, don't, don't ever think you were unimportant. If you have a story to tell me, Please come and tell me. If you're in the Rhodesian forces, then we've got a channel for you as well. It's called Legacy uh, Guest, I believe. So come and talk to me. Come and tell me your story before it's too late. And until we meet again, God bless.